All right. Again, welcome everyone to uh, that's a lot check with six installment of the Rubicon lecture series. Um, nice guest speaker. I think you've all uh, read the description and the invitations we've sent out, but the illustrious brother Michael Lake is the past master of the Timberville Lodge. Um, numerous offices and titles, too many. I'll let him tell you the ones he wants to share with you. Um, but now just uh, join me in welcoming Brother Mike Lake. Greetings, my uh, Ohio brothers from Eastern Idaho, where it is a overcast 40 degrees outside. Uh, we've had our first snowfall of the year this weekend, a uh, little bit here and there. Uh, that's a, important uh, to our talk tonight because it signals the that we're reaching the end of the harvest and we're ready to begin the dark, cold winter. This is a transitional time. Uh, it marked the ancient Celts New Year, and it's a time of year when it is believed that the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead became blurred. Now, this time of year and the changing of the seasons tends to evoke feelings of nostalgia, and with it, the, trans the, the traditions of recalling our stories, our superstitions, uh, and the mysteries and the unexplained. Now, there is no shortage of ghost stories, and some of those involve uh, Masonic lodges. In this presentation, I intend to give some examples, but what I'd also like to do is explore some potential explanations and some of the allegorical and symbolic side of hauntings. So... Our first example is the Kent Masonic Center, which was the former home of Marvin S. Kent, who constructed it as a family home between 1880 and 1884, when the Kent family moved in. Kent's son, William Kent, married Kitty North, who met a tragic end in the home on May 19, 1886. The Kent family sold the structure to the Rockton Lodge, number 316, who began occupying the building on November 1st, 1923. Since the lodge's claiming of the Kent home, members and visitors have reported a full-body apparition of a woman in old-fashioned white dress, uh, thought to be the ghost of Kitty North Kent, appearing in various locations throughout the former mansion. The apparition is said to be responsible for making loud noises in the third floor ballroom area, as well as leaving scratch marks all over the floor and walls. Another apparition that has been reported is the first librarian to operate the Kent Free Library that was housed in the home. She died working as a nurse in World War I. Her apparition is seen walking quickly throughout the home wearing an old fashioned nurse's uniform. The Morrison Masonic Temple in Elizabethtown, Kentucky is also rumored to be haunted. The ghosts of Civil War soldiers are rumored to have been spotted in this lodge building, and witnesses also have reported unexplained footsteps, knocking, and objects that move by themselves. The alarm goes off when no one is in the building, and ghosts have shown up in photos and been recorded as EVP or electronic voice phenomena. Legend has it that a ghostly presence once saved a lodge member when he fell ill and fainted while he was there alone. And some also claim a little girl haunts the balcony. Others claim two women who died in the building still haunt the lodge. Plano, Texas Lodge is reputed to be the most haunted building in Plano, Texas. Members claim to have heard footsteps on the spooky stairway watched seats mysteriously open and close in the lodge room, and seen chairs slide across the floor for no apparent reason. Of course, it doesn't hurt that the lodge has its own ghost story archivist, or that, according to his website, he's a master of telling those stories with just the right note of dispassionate spookiness. I would be remiss in failing to mention the Dayton Masonic Center, which was featured in Chris Woodyard's Haunted Ohio series of books. But the purpose of this talk isn't just to tell a few ghost stories, to explore the subject of haunting phenomena in our lodge buildings. We need to delve into a little more haunted history and philosophy. 
So what do all these examples have in common? Apart from being old and sometimes Victorian buildings with a history of actual death as opposed to the allegorical kind, what would be the cause of spiritual turbulence in our sacred spaces? Now, if we use Occam's razor, we might just look at the various explanations of debunked hauntings from overactive imaginations to infrasound, but that's pretty boring. So we'll look past that. Uh, as for the other options, we must proceed carefully as the implications begin to tug at the hems of our belief systems. For example, the Christian church fathers have long debated the theological issues raised by ghosts, primarily focusing on an episode in the book of Samuel, when King Saul consulted with the witch of Endor to summon the spirit of Samuel. This story would seem to affirm the spirits of the dead may return, and could even be summoned or controlled through ritualistic or magical practices. In his philosophical treatise, Demonology, King James denies that the witch had truly summoned the spirit of Samuel. He wrote that the devil is permitted at times to take on the likeness of the saints, citing 2 Corinthians, which states that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. Now, King James, to whom we credit the King James translation of the Bible, was somewhat obsessed by the occult, and his 1597 book on demonology was a profound influence on occult authors and the general understanding or impression of witchcraft and magic at that time. Such influence can be found in subsequent works by Cotton Mather, Francis Barrett, and of course in Shakespeare's Macbeth, Double Double, Toil and Trouble. Of the same incident, Martin Luther, who believed the dead were simply unconscious, indicated that it was the devil's ghost. And John Calvin wrote that he also believed it was not the real Samuel. The first literary reference to ghosts is found in the epic Gilgamesh, which was written between 2150 and 1400 BC and is considered the oldest piece of Western literature. Pliny the Younger recorded ghost stories in his letters in the first century, reporting the specter of an old man with a long beard, rattling chains, and haunting his house in Athens. The word haunting is used in reference to entities or spiritual beings occupying a location for the first time probably in English literature in Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. In early British and Celtic lore, a place being haunted often referred to fairies or other mystical folk rather than the spirits of the dead. If haunting activity has a bona fide supernatural cause, as opposed to overactive imaginations or some other mundane explanation, what might the type and origin of the entities causing such phenomena be? And that question is important to exploring the nature of hauntings in our lodges. But we have to begin with haunted houses. Historically, the haunted house seems to be an archetype, an emanation from the human subconscious or a symbol from our dreams. In the language of dreams, a house usually represents our personality, our identity, or our self. Unwelcome visitors in this dream house often take on the most frightful form evoking our primal fears of evil spirits and seem to represent a metaphor for a loss of control or of free will, of being invaded by a consciousness not our own. Such dreams may be interpreted as warnings that we are allowing ourselves to be controlled or manipulated by people or situations in our waking life. It could also mean that we are letting ourselves become occupied by unseen forces like bad memories, the karma of past deeds, bad habits, negative thoughts, obsessions, anything that might interfere with our free will. The art and symbolism of the haunted house usually involves some classical features like locked, secret, or cursed rooms, such as the red room at the Amityville house, or the secret rooms and passages in any of the old dark house movie genres. Is this art imitating life or life imitating art? In either case, 
These represent the secrets we keep in the dark rooms behind the locked doors in our minds. Opening those doors or illuminating those rooms makes us very vulnerable. It lets our demons or our secrets out or perhaps lets other influences in. The light on in the upstairs window can be representative of the head of the physical body and a consciousness mysteriously returned to an abandoned shell. We should recognize this type of symbolic reference to human physiology from certain references to the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, when the keepers of the house tremble and those looking through the windows be darkened. Now, haunted houses typically also have a history, particularly a secret history or one involving strong and particularly negative emotions, tragedy, death, bloodshed, torment. Alternatively, haunted locations are often in our lore, the result of people inviting spiritual energies by dabbling with the occult, especially without the proper ritualistic protections unwittingly or deliberately creating a space or location that is a gateway, as it were, between worlds. And what good haunted house tale doesn't start off with, it was a dark and stormy night. In stories, haunted houses seem to be surrounded by a perpetual storm with wind, banging shutters, and light. Might not these raging elements beating upon the edifice represent an ever-present and chaotic spirit world. Now, if a haunted house is symbolic of the individual, haunted by their own secrets, tragedies, desires, or misdeeds, what about other haunted places? In most ghost stories, ghosts typically haunt either the place they lived, especially places associated with suffering and mental illness, like lunatic asylums or prisons, Alcatraz is well known for its rumored hauntings, or they could haunt the place they died, such as a hospital or battlefield, Gettysburg being a famous example. Lastly, of course, the place a body lies. Every culture has associated the presence of the shells of the dead with the presence of the spirits of the dead and holds burial grounds sacred or in fear. In the fifth chapter of Mark, we read about the man possessed, by an impure spirit who lived among the tombs. Sometime around the fifth century, variations on the phrase, rest in peace, began appearing on tombstones. Rest in peace. Is that maybe suggesting people were suspicious there was an alternative? The famous demonologists, Ed and Lorraine Warren, had explanations for haunted cemeteries, or rather possessed ones. They explained that wicked spirits have a hatred for humanity and are attracted to death and decay, often taking up residence among the dead. And the foul smell that is in lore associated with the presence of demons is attributed to the residue of putrefaction from the places these spirits occupy. Illustrious brother Manly P. Hall in his Secret Teachings of All Ages advises that all beings have an invisible nature that remains until the physical form is entirely disintegrated and that these etheric doubles seen around graveyards have given rise to a belief in ghosts, but he goes no farther. If we are going to be open-minded, we must consider that haunting activity in a lodge building could simply be the returned spirits of the dead, ghosts, shades, phantoms, specters, spooks, wraiths, whites, apparitions, bogies, haunts. It's a simplistic explanation that a piece of the soul or spirit ripped away from its physical abode and for whatever reason earthbound, possibly experiencing confusion, fear, regret, and other ghostly emotions, returns to a place of spiritual contentment or brotherhood, seeking solace. The surviving personality of the past master that keeps coming back to lodge even after he has forever donned his white lambskin, incorporeally. He sits on the sidelines, reliving his memories, maybe even occasionally participating by making noises, moving objects, or whispering in ghostly and grumpy tones, that's not the way we did it my year. <laughs> as convenient an explanation as that sounds, it is contrary to Masonic philosophy that instructs us that death is but the messenger sent to lead us from the imperfect to the all-perfect lodge, not to condemn us to wander somewhere between. 
And while Blue Lodge ritual makes no mention of ghosts, some specters do make an appearance in the dramas of the Scottish Rite. Now we may for a moment entertain the consideration that King James, Luther, Calvin were on the right track. And rather than the spirits of the dead, supernatural activity could be caused by masquerading inhuman spirits. For our purposes, we might call them demons, fallen angels, the cliffoth of the Kabbalah, shells. The interpretation depends on your personal beliefs and paradigms. In any case, such entities, if you believe they exist, bear us no goodwill, and indications of their presence should be treated with exquisite caution and not encouraged. I'm going to suggest, however, that in the harmonious and proficient lodge, there should be no reason for such entities to be attracted. The third possible explanation I will throw at you, and the one that I personally think is the most interesting, is that of artificial entities existing on the astral plane that are called thought forms. Thought forms appear in many cultures and are known by a variety of names, such as tulpas, servitors, egregores, and elementaries. Not elemental spirits, mind you, but elementaries. Paracelsus devoted much writing to elementaries. He considered them evil beings outside the natural orders of spirits, created in the invisible realms by excesses of human thought and emotion, corruption of character, degeneration of faculties, and misuse of powers. Elementaries are created by humans and dependent on them for their existence. If they are nourished enough by powerful human emotion, they can become independent and may turn on their creators, parasitically draining them of their life force and vitality and creating an unhealthy mental and physical environment that is fertile for the negative emotions that will sustain them. And this can take the form of mental disorders such as obsession, negative physical actions such as anger, aggression, corruption, like an imaginary friend that begins to suggest harmful things. Intense negative emotions stimulate the imagination in a way that opens the door for the attachment of elementary spirits. Recovery is accomplished through a reversal of thoughts and emotions to the positive, which denies the elementaries of the energy needed to sustain them and eventually forces them away. Servitors are thought forms created deliberately. Their creator gives the servitor a name and a function usually also a sigil as a means of controlling it. If not controlled, servitors can also become independent uh, of their creators and like Dr. Frankenstein's monster may run amok. Egregores are thought forms created intentionally or unintentionally by groups of people with a common purpose, like a family, a club, a political party, a church, or a country. You've no doubt heard of things like school spirit, esprit de corps. These represent an emanation or manifestation of a collective group mind. Like other thought forms, they can eventually become autonomous entities with the power to influence, for better or worse, depending on the thoughts and intentions of the group that created it. Thought forms can be either symbiotic or parasitic in nature, depending on the thoughts and emotions that gave rise to them which is why we are so often admonished to circumscribe our desires and keep our passions, our strong emotions in due bounds because thoughts become things, in this case, literally. Now I have a personal theory about this next type of common phenomenon. Even if you have never seen a ghost, at some point in your life, you have no doubt experienced what are called shadow people. You have had a feeling of being watched and you were supposed to be alone. Uh, you've picked up a shadowy figure out of the corner of your eye that wasn't there when you suddenly looked or caught a fleeting glimpse of a person darting around a corner when you entered a room. Now, based on places I have been where I have personally experienced the shadow people phenomenon, my opinion is that these are elementaries created by patterns of dishonest or sneaky behavior. That sort of activity seems to summon shadow people or attracts or creates thought forms that are echoes of that behavior. 
the presence of shadow people in your lodge building may be cause for concern. Or maybe not. It might just be your imagination. Might we then explain evidence of haunting activity, particularly in our lodges, as the manifestation of cumulative synthetic astral energy, whether it is the result of rogue elementary entities or thought forms or the egregore of the lodge. If the building was something else before it was a lodge, it is possible that residual astral patterns are still there, not the ghostly surviving consciousnesses of previously living individuals, but the energetic patterns or residues that their frequent presence in that place left behind. Especially the collective accumulation of these patterns given new energy by the presence of a lodge and its members. Now in Freemasonry, the form of a lodge, our opening and closing rituals, our tools and symbols are designed ostensibly to protect the harmony of the lodge from unhealthy influences, physical and spiritual. The ritualistic opening of a Masonic lodge shouldn't be looked at merely as an administrative inconvenience. It is in fact a traditional ceremony for the creation of a sacred space, similar to the banishing rituals and various ceremonial practices or lesser forms of exorcism. Not that we're trying to cast out evil demons in the Hollywood sense, but we are making a deliberate ritualistic effort to create a place in space and time that is different from and free from the disharmony of the outside world. Our rituals over time should banish negative residual energies if they are simple thought forms and if astral or spiritual entities adhere to the constructs of Western mystical tradition. What do I mean by that? When we look at rituals that were designed to deal with supernatural entities, either to summon or dismiss them, control or inquire of them. It takes us on a journey of millennia back to the ancient practices of the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Chaldee, which formed the earliest roots of Hebrew mysticism, which over the centuries formed the basis for the majority of Western mystical systems. In the Book of Enoch, which didn't make the cut into official Roman canon, the eighth chapter of the Book of Watchers expounds on the Genesis account of the corrupted angels' activities on earth before the deluge, particularly with regard to the creation of weaponry, and more importantly for our purposes, the mystical arts. It says, And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields. Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Armaros, the resolving of enchantments. Barakajal taught astrology, Kokabel the constellations, Ezekiel the knowledge of the clouds, Arakiel the signs of the earth, Shamsiel the signs of the sun, and Sariel the course of the moon. The point being that man's interactions with the spirit world begins, well, at the very beginning. And from our earliest ancestors up to modern times, there have been superstitions and associated practices, rituals, formulated to bind or influence supernatural entities. But what if that's all hooey? Rituals have a powerful impression upon the human psyche, true. But what if spiritual entities don't follow these rules? What if the ceremonies of the early wizards like Agrippa and even more modern sorcerers like John Dee or everyone's favorite who doesn't need to be named are just human constructs that have no real power or influence over the spirit world? These old wizards seem to think that spirits were like dogs that could be commanded to sit and stay. What if they're more like cats who are busy dealing with their own affairs and don't really care what we want of them, but just pay us a visit from time to time, mainly for their own benefit? And what if they are more like roaring lions walking about? Now that opens a can of worms and suggests that if we rely on such practices, we may find ourselves like the sons of Sceva, Itinerant Jewish exorcists who tried to invoke the name of Jesus over those with evil spirits. And this is perhaps the first example of a Christianized exorcism based only on words that is ritual. The book of Acts explains that these would-be exorcists would say, I bind you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, I think this is also the origin of practices like sending an angry email and CCing the boss. Eventually, one of the evil spirits answered them, 
Jesus I know, and I am acquainted with Paul, but who are you? The book of Acts goes on to say that the man with the evil spirit then jumped on them and overpowered them so violently that they all ran out of the house naked and wounded. Obviously, words were not enough. There was a missing ingredient. Fast forward to today. Modern occult practices advocate rituals for banishing unwanted energies, and these rituals typically follow the same format of reciting or invoking various names of deity, then issuing demands along with visualizing the effects. So what if these rituals, these behaviors, really have no effect? Or the opposite effect? What if ritual practices actually make us more visible to the astral or etheric world and contrary to our intended purposes, such rituals act to attract discarnate entities or even unfriendly energies to us instead. Now, for those not familiar with what I mean when I say banishing, what I'm referring to are ritualistic practices designed to cleanse or purify spaces, ritualistic objects, and even people. Such rituals are usually performed before other rituals to protect the practitioners, to prevent the intrusion of unwanted influence, and to dedicate those places or items to a specific use. Banishing rituals can be very formal and mystical, such as the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram used by the Golden Dawn and diagrammed here. They can involve ritualistic cleansing and ablutions, such as the familiar ceremony of Christian baptism. Or, our opening and closing rituals in Lodge likewise follow a distinct pattern of banishing rituals. We close off the space to the outside world. We station a guard. We face to the four cardinal directions. There's a declaration of intent. We invoke a higher power for protection and blessing. We perform symbolic actions and gestures. So are the stories of haunted Masonic lodges due to ghosts, demons, thought forms, or more mundane explanations? Well, I'll leave it up to you to make up your own mind on that. But I would like you to consider and remember that when you participate in a ritual, even the opening and closing of a lodge, that you are actually wielding a force. Just like when you use electricity or drive a car. And forces that are handled carelessly can be disruptive or even destructive. I'm not speaking as would an officer of our Grand Lodge about word perfect ritual, but about ritual conducted deliberately and with intent. A sloppy opening can be a declaration to the universe that a lodge either doesn't know what it is doing or doesn't care enough to do it well. That is profaning the ritual, but worse, it allows or might even invite lower, unworthy thoughts and energies, harmful, parasitic thought forms and larvae to intrude on that space, which breeds disharmony and, as Paracelsus warns, disease. If there is disharmony, corruption, or strife in a lodge, I think it unsurprising that unwholesome energies might be attracted or created and may make their presence known through some type of undesirable phenomenon or at least sensations or feelings that might indicate a threatening presence. In the same way, the egregore of a healthy lodge may from time to time let us know that something is there to guard the brethren and protect the harmony of the lodge. Well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation and that it provoked some thoughts and ideas. We have some time for your comments and questions, and I would love to hear them. Other than the uh, shadow figures that you were talking about, have you experienced a ghostly encounter before? I have not um, that I know of. And uh, it's an interesting question because I think it's very difficult for us sometimes to know whether or not what we're experiencing uh, is supernatural or natural sometimes. the We, we have develop these incredible filters uh, that we filter out anything that we cannot explain, you know, what, what we can't uh, explain, we sometimes ignore. So what if uh, we have all maybe seen some kind of supernatural phenomenon, but we rationalized it, 
those filters in our heads automatically kicked in and said, no, 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 this is something very normal. So uh, that said, uh, I would say it might be a good exercise for us sometimes to, uh, without creating any kind of paranoia in ourselves, consider that the things that we see every day that might seem so very ordinary might not always have a very ordinary explanation uh, and might merit further investigation. But to uh, straight up answer the question, no, I've, I've observed shadow people phenomenon uh, in some places, uh, which drew my attention, you know, what the heck is going on here? But other than that, I cannot say that I've ever experienced any other kind of uh, spiritual or ghostly phenomena. Other questions? I had a situation um, many years ago when I was about 19, 20 years old. And uh, I, I'm glad that you went into other life forms or, or thoughts or you know, thing, energy from you know, past energies and past consciousness. There's a place in Toledo, in downtown Toledo, called the Pythian Castle, mm -hmm. which is erected by the Knights of Pythias. And when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, uh, a guy named Ed Embry owned the building, and uh, we had concerts in the old ballrooms. There was a ballroom on the third floor, and then the private ballroom, which was actually where all the degrees would have taken place, up in the, very, in the fifth and sixth floors of the building. And just to make a long story short, I mean, I saw a lot of stuff, but I was in the building a lot because I was the stage manager for the concerts. And one day I had to go up into the very top of the building into, if you're familiar with the building, there's a turret, like a castle turret. And we had been doing some work up there and somebody had left the hammer and I needed to get the hammer. <laughs> Back in those days, drummers would nail their drums to the stage and I had to pull out nails. So I ran up to get this hammer and I'm all by myself and it's dusk and there's light coming in the windows. And I was coming down from the attic through this, uh, long corridor of dressing rooms where the brethren of the Knights Pythias would, would get ready for degrees. And uh, all of a sudden I stopped as I got there because I heard something and I heard footsteps walking across the wooden floor directly towards me down this long hall. I just sort of froze for a few minutes or for a few seconds and, and listened and watched. Couldn't really see anything but as it came towards me. And then I ran like hell, but uh, <laughs> but I've always figured, as you said, that it, it, it had to have been, you know, some type of conscious or some type of energy left over from all the years of degrees and ceremonials that they had had there, uh, you know, rather than a ghost. So I, I really, really was interested in that section, but I just want to share that because it was an actual experience. Uh, there was a lot of other things that happened, but that's... So that brings up a really good point that a lot of phenomena that people observe is auditory phenomena. Uh, things that they hear, things they see, and these uh, are dependent on our senses. Uh, well, we know that our eyes and our ears don't always tell us the truth. Uh, and that thought forms, I think, have a very difficult time with the physical world. That's not their natural place. They're created on the astral or the etheric realm. Well, there, I think they have free reign. So they can create hallucinations, even um, joint hallucinations, multiple hallucinations of footsteps, of sounds. Uh, people have reported when they uh, reported things like uh, possession of a house, they uh, hear the door opening and closing or a window opening and closing or a toilet flushing. And when they observe it, it's not actually happening. But the sound is there, the sound of the footsteps, the sound of the door opening and closing. So some type of sensation or phenomena we experience because it's, depend, it's dependent on the computer. It's what's going on up here. And thought forms can influence this much easier than they can actually, I think, ob uh, affect the, the objects of the physical world. So uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting story, and it brings up that very interesting point. Well, it's just like I have actually two questions uh, with your presentation, if I may address them. Please. 
the first one I uh, will touch upon uh, recurring hauntings and then actual live phenomenon. Do you believe that over time, the let's just say something dramatic, somebody got murdered in a house and we see recurring haunting, do you think that the level of energy that was committed there, do you think that wears down over time or is it like a re replaying of a video over and over and over again? And do you think that over time that it just eventually drifts away and if you don't give it any thought or any uh, put any um, intention with it, do you think eventually a haunting disappears over time? Well, I'm going to, for that point to um, something. Uh, so there was a author named Austin Osmond Spare who kind of in his writings began a practice uh, called chaos magic. Now, unlike old Western magical traditions that relied on a very fixed paradigm, which usually goes back to, again, King James's demonology and subsequent works, the, the, the chaos magicians, you know, this, this came about in the 60s, really, the Illuminates of Thanateros and other groups like that. And they use what they called a disposable paradigm. So uh, whatever you were, whatever effect you wanted to intend, and they believed it was all uh, very heavily invested in thought forms and, and egregore and things like that, it didn't matter what you believed. If you needed protection, for example, you didn't need to uh, invoke archangels, you could invoke Superman or a Jedi Knight if you wanted. As long as you believe enough, that energy was put out there into the etheric realm. And their banishing rituals, they said banish by laughter, because laughter takes us from a mode that is so heavily uh, wrapped up into those wavelengths of brain that uh, happen when we're into ritual, and it breaks us back into the, the normal world, the normalized world. Manly P. Hall also uh, gave examples of people who had dabbled with um, magical practices and scared themselves. And then he would have to kind of bring them back to reality uh, by getting them to re-engage in normalized behavior because our normal world reestablishes those filters I was talking about before. So to answer your question, you know, using that, I think that the more we give something energy, the more we say that's the haunted house, right? That's the haunted lodge. That's where this happened we reinvigorate that energy every time someone thinks of it that way. Whereas when we return that place to a more mundane usage, I think that over time, yes, that energy can fade and normalize. Excellent. My second question is, in masonry, we are given working tools that we are supposed to utilize in ourselves, but Anybody who is a fan of the paranormal or supernatural, there are also working tools in that realm, such as Ouija boards, dowsing rods, protections like special seeds or sage, and everything else in there. Should mortals mess with this kind so of that's, that's where I had mentioned that one of the things that seems to attract um, unhealthy energies or, or entities to people is or places is that dabbling with the occult without the traditional ritualistic protections and again that's dependent on if spirits adhere to our ritualistic constructs if it actually means anything to them uh, or if spirits are thought forms maybe it does simply by the virtue that we create them here and so we make up the rules for those thought forms as we create them again, there's a couple different paths that might go down. However, when you look at something like a Ouija board, when people be uh, play with those, you are skipping any kind of protective ritual that is um, traditionally a, a major component in any kind of a ceremonial use. Like I said, even the opening of our lodge, we don't just dive straight into business or degree work. We must open the lodge. We must establish those protections. There's a reason for that. 
there's a reason why in many ceremonial magical practices there is that establishment of those protections even if they're just mental barriers or filters that we ourselves create uh, because if we just dive right into something like a Ouija board those people who uh, engage in uh, occult practices with drugs um, there are I mean that's throwing that gateway wide and, and, and just taking those filters right out of the equation I think it's very dangerous uh, because um, no matter what the source or, or cause of the entities might be or, or thought forms or energies that we encounter without some established protections, e even, even our own magic protections, even if it's no more than Dumbo's magic feather, right? Uh, we don't have anything to hang our hat on or, or our safety on and that leaves us very vulnerable. So yes, the working tools are part of those protections uh, in a lodge, um, things like uh, burning sage, that is a traditional protection, incense, that's a, that's a protection. When you burn incense in a lodge and someone's like, oh, what is that smell? It's too much for me. It's working. No, <laughs> uh, no, but the, the point being that, uh, yes, all of those things, uh, the incense and sage and um, opening rituals, uh, whether it's done in, in a lodge, which again, primarily our rituals are meant for the improvements of this. It's not to summon any kind of entities or anything. It's to summon our better selves. Uh, but uh, for those people who do engage in those other practices, to do so without protective rituals, I think, uh, again, no matter what the cause, even if it's all in your head, can be very dangerous because this can be very dangerous. Excellent. I actually have one more question that came to my mind because this is one of my favorite topics. I've been into it since I was a little kid and I've had a lot of different experiences throughout my life. You know, we're living in a world where, you know, media shows us that it's becoming a very dark place, a very dangerous place. Countrymen are at each other's throats just because of different color hats and whatnot. Do you believe that we are entering a new spiritual movement? It seems like a lot of Gen Zs and millennials are getting into more pagan, dare I say, practices uh, and leaving the dogmatic niche of the church. Do you think that there's a spiritual movement or a paranormal movement that is that we're going back to as we used to see in the Victorian age uh, with seances and scrying and whatnot? Or do you think that there's just a paranormal entities are resurfacing in our, uh, in our world today? That'll be my last question. Um, again, this is strictly my opinion, uh, but I, I think that since we stopped burning witches at the stake, it, it's always kind of, you know, been something that periodically comes and goes, right? There was the age of Aquarius, you know, uh, there was the table tilting in the early, you know, 1800 spiritualism. Uh, it was very popular for a while. So various uh, uh, manifestations of um, engagement with the spirit world, it comes and goes, right? Uh, hence why all the books in the occult are in the new age section. It's always the new thing, right? Um Getting to your point on uh, more modern embracing of, say, paganism, I think media does have a major impact on that. Uh, you know, the things we watch, the things we, we feed our minds uh, have an indelible influence. And if you look at the popular shows, things like Vikings and The Last Kingdom and everything, there has been a, a, a major popular culture um, embrace of... Uh, especially the the Viking type lore, you know, or uh, Odin and Thor and all that stuff. Not your Marvel Cinematic Universe Odin, but like your Viking kind of Odin. And I think a lot of this ties in very much with our warrior culture. We have a lot of returning vets who um, need to find some kind of peace or explanation in their wartime activities. And I think a lot of them have embraced this uh, again, the, the ancient warrior cultures as, as a way to sort this out and to carve out a place in this world that makes some sense because very little of the world makes sense. Hence the importance of organizations like Freemasonry that uh, can hand people these rites of passage, can hand people these 
these thoughts and and ways to sort out the confusion in the world um, w- without embracing the elder gods. Um, so uh, y- yes, to your point, I believe there there is an embrace of um, non traditional uh, in Western culture um, religious paradigms. But I think that, that, again, has come and gone for a long time. That That's kind of a, a wave that, that we keep riding, and it surges, and then it kind of tapers off, and then it surges again, and then tapers off. Um, yeah. Manly P. Hall was talking about this in his lectures back in the you know, 60s, uh, seeing a lot of the same thing. So, again, you look at events in the world at the time, it was the beginning of the Cold War when he was talking about some of this stuff. You know, it was the major uh, stand-up of nuclear arms. The world was crazy. And, and he mentioned it's funny because like in Russia, for example, despite all their attempts to suppress religion, once there were thousands of warheads, you know, aimed at each other, the church was growing like crazy because, it, you know, if we were all going to be blown to kingdom come, it didn't matter whether you were a member of the party. Uh, so people started embracing more of that. And I think that uh, eventually that's what will happen. And, and again, people are seeking spiritual answers. I, you know, uh, they do not always look at the traditional uh, church practices because maybe they grew up in them and didn't agree with them. So they reach out and try to find something new. It is hope that uh, eventually they, uh, they get led to whatever is right for them. And, and I won't judge because uh, it's not my place, but whatever is right for them, hopefully they find it. Uh, Brother, Doug, Brother King? Mike, I have a question. We've talked about the, the process of opening and closing the lodges in the three degrees, and that it has some spiritual, at least a minimum psychological significance. Uh, my question is the actual act of dedication of a lodge space by the Grand Lodge to a very ancient ceremony. My question is, isn't that, does that in effect create uh, or put the lodge on the spiritual map by the fact that there's a dedicated space before any work is ever done and it continues on until the lodge closes? And if that's the case, was that an intentional act by the creators of the craft? I yield back the rest of my time. For that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. Um, that's an excellent question. And, and yes, so I would believe that uh, the the initial dedication of the lodge is sort of the birth of that sacred space that then must be maintained and sustained by continual ritual. And the longer it is practiced there, the stronger that egregore becomes. So the, you know, the lodge that meets in the same place with the same tools, and why do we value this? Look, these, these working tools, the, this lodge room, I mean, I'm not talking about the carpet and stuff like that, but the actual space of the lodge, the tools of the lodge, right? Those things, the Bible, uh, why do we hold the George Washington Bible so sacred in St. John's Lodge? There's tradition that's built up in that. You know, the, you know, the people who've touched and handled that book, and there's this desire to tie ourselves to that, and we do. Uh, we do tie ourselves to that. So yes, I think that that dedication of that building and, and part of the creation of a sacred space or banishing ritual uh, is to dedicate, like I said, that space, a person, a tool, an item to a specific purpose. And so yes, that lodge room then it becomes dedicated to that purpose and then must be sustained uh, in that purpose. So um, forgive me, what was the second part of your question? Whether or not that spirituality of the dedication was purposely done by the creators of the craft. Yes. Well, since this has gone on since time immemorial, I can't really comment uh, on the intentions of our forefathers in the craft. Uh, but I would say since a lot of what we do is derived from older rites, I know some authors like uh, Arturo de Hoyos uh, say basically, hey, look, uh, Masonic rites come from the rites of Isis and Osiris. Uh, some people believe that uh, it's influenced by the rites of Eleusis. Um, I think it might be 
it's kind of a complex. Masonic rights are, are human rights. We, we, are, we have taken humanity's history and rituals, and I think that they have all found their way into this accumulation that is Freemasonry, and we've adapted them to meet our own values. So obviously, if, if we were uh, performing the rites of Isis and Osiris, that might conflict with someone's Christian sensibilities. Uh, and it might have gotten our early uh, ancestors uh, drawn and quartered uh, or burned at the stake. So uh, I think that I don't want to say the ritual was camouflaged, but it was adapted. It was annexed, just like the early Catholic Church annexed the Roman rituals to form a, you know, a lot of the, the rites of the Church of Rome. So I would say, well, I'm not sure if our founders, you know, back in the in 1717 that formed the first Grand Lodge, I don't know if, if they per se said, oh, no, this is important. We've got to do it this way. Um, I think that the history of our, of our culture, the history of rituals or knowledge of rituals was, um, was somehow preserved and that, uh, uh, that that's why we do it that way, because we have preserved rituals that we really don't know where they came from. It reminds me of uh, in Brazil, there's a, a native tribe that still sings songs that they have forgotten what the words mean. They sing the songs. It's passed on for generations. They still sing them, but they don't know what the words mean anymore, but they still sing the songs. So maybe, maybe it's something like that. in the past that animals have the tendency to react to certain things which may be spiritual. Why is this and why do humans don't recognize what these animals are telling us? Yeah, so um, animals, I think, don't put up the same filters that we have. Their senses are heightened. So, you know, when your cat's like staring at the wall next to you and kind of freaks you out, you know, does it you know, hear a bug walking on the wall outside or is it just having a cat daydream? I mean, it's a cat, Who, who's to say? Or is it seeing some kind of discarnate entity creeping up on us? <laughs> I don't know, I ask your cat, I suppose. But yes, I think that um, animals are probably more susceptible to that sort of thing because they don't have those filters, they aren't encouraged to maintain those filters like we are, like we have to, to function in a real world. Thank you. Any other questions for Illustrious Lake? Illustrious Lake, do you have any closing comments? Uh, closing remarks. Uh, brethren, it's been wonderful to share this time with you. I appreciate your attention and the excellent questions. And again, I, I hope that uh, you found this uh, at least thought provoking um, and maybe gave you something to uh, consider um, and to enjoy in this uh, Halloween season. Thank you very much. Halloween themed lecture series, and you really did a phenomenal job. One more time for Illustrious. Thank you, All right, we're going to go back to lodge here in a moment, but before we do, I'd like to invite Illustrious Lake to come up and say a few words. Um, I know, light. I know. Let there be light. Um, I this Rubicon lecture series has been really phenomenal. to our next lecture series in November. Uh, one of my last uh, speakers before I'm going